One thing that, that really uh, strikes me as I go around the world and as I travel is um, people are shocked. I was at the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International, FGBMFI, in Houston. They rang me up and said, would I go to speak at the World Convention uh, in Houston? They said it was the highlight of the conference. But one thing I did, I, I was praying for the sick at the end, and there were three people to pray for the sick. There was, and I was this end. And, and uh, you know, they said, well, if you need prayer, come out the front. And it was embarrassing because when I looked, there was kind of five people up there about six people up there, and about 200 people this side. And I thought, oh, look. And, and I started to pray for the sick. And my wife will tell you, when I got to the last person, I looked around and the hall was empty. They don't care for people. Christianity without compassion is not Christianity at all. And I was disgusted. I mean, I was so concentrating on, on, on the people I was praying, I didn't even notice. They have no time for people. And if you have no time for people, don't call yourself a minister. Jesus Christ was amongst the multitude. From morning till night, he's spent with a multitude. That's what we're called to do. We're called to be ministers of righteousness and of care. What upsets me most is that ministry today has become kind of a business. They're more interested in screwing money out of people than they are in caring for their needs. And Jesus Christ came to meet the needs of people. Uh, you know, that's the way it is. And, and I, I just find all these little tricks they play to get money out of people make me sick. You go to some meetings and they spend 45, 50 minutes trying to screw money out of people, 20 minutes supposedly preaching the gospel. That's not Christianity. It's wrong. And... and I find I'm a bit of a radical voice, and it upsets people. Um, I suppose I can't help being radical, because to me, it's so wrong. You know, Jesus never, ever, uh, when I read my Bible, he, he never took collections. Yet Judas held the bag, and he was a thief, and he couldn't empty it. If you meet people's needs, and if people are really healed and really delivered, God will provide. If you have to beg for it and screw people for it, I'll tell you what, it's not God who's providing it. It's your trickery. And I don't believe in trickery. And it's your thieving. And it's wrong. So I want to talk about being a radical voice. You know, uh, I think every Christian should be radical. Don't you? But then you might mistake what radical means. And that's why you get it wrong. And um, so I, I'm just going to share a few thoughts with you this morning. Uh, it's on redemption, but, but you just need to think about it. Just think. There's nothing wrong with thinking. Radical comes from the word radix, and it's a root, and it means pertaining to the root, proceeding directly from the root. Radix, it's a root, and it's a pert or, of or pertaining to the root, proceeding directly from the root. A and what has happened is people have lost the very root of Christianity. They've lost the source of life. And you're radical when you start taking people back to the simplicity of the gospel. They call you radical. Now, what we are is conventional. 
But because of what's happened in the church today, we're considered radicals. The charismatic move has gone so far away from Christ that all they want is wealth, prosperity, health, but they forget the root. And the radical man says, hey, you've lost everything. And they have. So the church has become a place where people go so they can be successful in business, successful in this, successful in that. And, and you've got people call themselves apostles of prosperity. And the cross of Jesus Christ is no longer heard of or spoken of in the church. The blood of Jesus Christ is no longer the thing that purchases us. And denial and self-denial is no longer a requirement of the gospel. Why? You can have anything you want. And that is not Christianity. It is a false gospel. And you're radical when you begin to take people back to the Bible. And the second meaning is uh, pertaining to the root or origin, reaching to the center, to the foundation, to the ultimate sources, to the principles. Original, fundamental, thoroughgoing, unsparing. Is that plain? So any Christian should be a radical. Amen? And if we're not radical... We're not Christian. I, I just want you to understand that. That comes uh, from Webster's Revised Unabridged Dictionary, 1913. Um, you've got to get it from some source. Today, Christianity is so wishy-washy that they don't mention the things that are important. It's amazing. We've got a Bible... And people go to the Old Covenant and Old Covenant doctrines and they don't know what the New Covenant in Christ is. And therefore they preach things out of the Old Testament that don't apply to Christians at all. Because they're ignorant. T.L. Osborne's trying to get me to write a book on the Pauline epistles and, and do a red letter book on the Pauline epistles on redemption. Because Paul was the one who... Uh, really spoke of the truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ and what we've got in the new covenant. Jesus preached old covenant mainly and, and he ministered and fulfilled the law and the, the old covenant. He didn't preach the new covenant. The day of Pentecost brought about the church. Church didn't exist till the day of Pentecost. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, let's go on. God's ways are not man's. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. Now, God, when he wanted to do something in the earth, raised up a man. I believe in one man ministry. And if you don't believe in one man ministry, don't call yourself a Christian. Let me tell you why. Adam sinned and sin came by one. Let me tell you, Jesus came and redemption came by one. One man ministry. Sin came by one, redemption came by one. His name is Jesus. I believe in one man ministry. And, and don't get the idea, Paul was an apostle. And he said he wasn't behind the chief. Not a whit behind. Man born out of due time. And he didn't go around saying, well, you know, um, it's body ministry. There's no such thing. My Bible says in Romans 10, how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall he preach except his sent? Paul, when he got... <laughs> got around people, he preached. Whitfield, the great revivalist in New England, he preached to 20,000 people in the open air. And he preached for six hours. You go into some churches and they don't want a sermon over 20 minutes. You can't even think in 20 minutes. How shall they hear without a? How shall he preach except his? 
Oh, yeah, but in the modern day, you see, we need multimedia presentation. The mind can't concentrate for more than three minutes. Well, that's true. The modern mind can't concentrate on anything. That's the lie of the devil. God said we need preachers. Man says we mean, need multi... Let's have kind of a little drama group. Let's have a little jazz group. Let's have a little uh, rock band. You know, we've got to attract young people by killing them off with the world's ways. My Bible says they won't hear without a preacher. So, you need a preacher. If you haven't got a preacher in your church who preaches for at least an hour, then you're dead. Can't develop anything properly and get people's minds and hearts registered if you don't preach. Let's go on. Our root is Christ. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And we need to know the person of Jesus. We don't need to know doctrine. We need to know the reality of the person. One of the things that's so dangerous, if you know all your rights, and I hate it when I hear Christians talk about my right as a Christian, you have rights. Because there's a legal truth there are legal things that have been established in redemption that are legal. But the reality of Christianity is a person, not a right. And the person is Jesus Christ. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And I find Christians, they want to claim their right. They want to claim this. They want to claim that. And I get repulsed by such filth. We, we, we love a person. His name is Jesus. And I find people, they don't talk about him. They don't know him. And they misrepresent him. It's the person of Christ. Is that clear? The root of righteousness... You'll find that in Proverbs 12, 3. You know, our, our God, we shall not be moved, and it, we yield fruit. And the reason we yield fruit is because we're, we're united with the root. And the root is Christ, centrality of everything. I had an apostle come to my church years ago. He said to me, you know, he said, you know, Bishop, the trouble with your church is you're too Jesus-centered. I said, I beg your pardon. He said, you're too Jesus-centered. I said, oh, thank you. <laughs> he said, no, no, it's wrong. He said, you don't talk about the Holy Spirit all the time. I said, no, because he came to talk of Jesus. If you had the Holy Spirit, you'd realize you should be Jesus-centered. I mean, how can they say things like that? A church, <laughs> who's our savior? His name is... Who's our Redeemer? Jesus. Who shed his blood for us? Jesus. Who testifies of him? The Holy Spirit. He came to testify. He didn't come to speak of himself. I find you go to church and all they talk about is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. The Ho and, you know, they're crazy. People write books saying you can know the Holy Spirit now as a person separate from Jesus. You can't. Horrible. False doctrine. Jesus. He's the only one. Do I believe in the baptism of the Spirit? Yes. Do I speak in tongues? Yes. Thank God I do. Do I believe in the gifts of the Spirit? Yes. If you're a babe in Christ, you need them. If only you'd grow up. Better to minister the life of Christ than the gifts. But that's another story.
If the root be holy, so are the branches. Romans eleven sixteen. That you being rooted and grounded in love. We're to be rooted and grounded in love. Love of what? Love of the brethren. Love of the household of faith. That's why it says, don't forsake the gathering of yourselves together as the manner of some is. We're grounded in love. And God is love. And we're grounded in the expression of the love of God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We're grounded in Christ. He's the foundation of our lives. And if we move away from that, we've moved away from truth. Here's the truth. Here's the way. Here's the life. We're rooted and built up in him, established in the faith. You've got to be rooted in Christ. Your roots must go down into him, and you're rooted in love. And you're rooted in the word of God. You're not rooted in some tingly experience. You're rooted in Christ. It's the Word. You know, the Spirit and the Word coming together. If you know all the benefits of being redeemed and you have a legalistic approach to it, you're in death. That's where Calvinism came from and, and hyper-Calvinism, which Spurgeon spoke against. I am a Calvinist, total Calvinist but not a hyper-Calvinist. I believe God is absolutely sovereign. I believe my God is in control. I believe my God is almighty God. Don't you? I believe he controls everything. The devil never controlled anything. He couldn't even control himself. And my God is almighty. Now, I'm a Calvinist, but not a hyper-Calvinist. I don't sit down because God controls everything and do nothing. I'm set on this earth to do something, to preach, to teach, to heal. That's what God sent me to do. And I believe in it with all my heart. I have a passion in it. Uh, and Do you know, the, the thing the devil wants to do is he wants to invalidate our ministries. He wants to stop us going. He wants to silence the voices that are radical. He, he, he doesn't want the gospel anymore. He wants me to stand up and tell him many ways to God. Everyone's in the image of God. You're just a bit messed up. You need straightening out. We can talk your problems through. What about repentance from dead works? What about turning it to go the right way? Oh, but there's many lifestyles. No, there's only one way in Christ. And when you stand up and say it, they get mad at you. We're radical. Uh, let's go on. The carnal mind, that's the natural mind, is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God, neither can be. Do you know, I, I meet people who've got real carnal minds. They always think in, in carnal terms. They don't think in God's terms. Uh, and when you start challenging them, uh, you find that their minds are, are the enemies of God. Do you know, I've had evangelicals get so mad at me they want to kill me they're like the Pharisees and Sadducees of old the, the carnal mind it, it's so angry against God because they can't have what they think they should have in Christ because they've never got dealt with the sin principle inside of them they haven't realized that Jesus Christ came to save his people from their sin. If you've got two natures working in you, it's because you're not born again. If you've got conflict inside, you've never met the Savior. Is that plain? 
If any man be in Christ Jesus, his new creation, all things are passed away, all things become new, and all things are of God, who in Christ Jesus hath reconciled us to himself. Now that's what the Bible says. I believe it. I know it. And if that hasn't happened inside, you're not a Christian. You're going to hell. Make no mistake. Is that plain? Hmm. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That's it. You know, you think you're going the right way and you, <laughs> you've had it. I meet people, they say, well, yeah. I know, I know that um, I'm born again. I know I'm saved. I said, how do you know? Well, I asked Jesus into my heart very well. I've met a lot of people that ask Jesus into their heart. Question is, did he come? People say to me, I know God. I said, that's all very well. But the real question and issue in life is, does God know you? It's not, do you know God? I'm sure you've got a God in the image of yourself. The question is, does God know you? In that day, many will say, Lord, Lord, we did this in my name, thy name, we, did, we prophesied in your name, we healed the sick in your name, and he'll say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. He didn't say you didn't know me. And when you start telling people that, you know, God... He's got to know you personally by name. If he doesn't know you personally by name, if you don't have personal relationship with God and you don't really know him in a personal way, I tell you, you're in trouble. Don't call yourself a Christian. Christ is our foundation. He's the root. Got to make sure he knows you. See, that, that's being radical. Do you know, in the old days, the Moravians, if you wanted to get baptized in water, they would spend three days examining you to find out whether you had true faith in Christ. The elders would sit you down for three days. You'd get examined, examined by them. They'd ask you questions. They'd go through the scriptures with you. They'd go through things with you. And they would challenge you. And you couldn't get baptized if you did not come up clean with every answer. Today, people come along, oh, I, I want to be baptized. Now the Moravians kept the, the work of God at a high point for a hundred years. I remember reading a book years ago, the ten fastest growing churches in Britain. By the time they got it out in the bookshops, nine of them didn't exist. You know, mushroom explosion. When they evaporated. I'm always suspicious. You know, things have got to stand the test of time. You know, in our church, we've got four generations of people in the church. Four generations. We've been 30 years. You know, you stand the test of time, but the generations go on. Go to Oral Roberts University. Richard Roberts is now the president of Oral Roberts University. Um, I know Oral and uh, Evelyn's gone home to be with the Lord. Uh, Richard is, is there, you know, his son. And, and he, you see, God is a God of generations. The promise is to you and to your children and to all that are far off. It's not a, a quick, you know, boom, church, boom, gone. We're rooted in him. Is that plain? Um, then it goes, How be it, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. 
For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. Full well you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your own tradition. Now that's the trouble. People want to keep their own beliefs, their own traditions. Well, I was always taught that. I've always believed that. And it's tradition. And you need to realize tradition's an enemy of reality. Amen? Glory to God. You know, I, I, you, if you worry about me, I'm stirred up. I'm, st I'm provoked. Can't help myself. Because it's so near to my heart. Everything within me. Uh, let's go on. Biblical facts. Facts. Big biblical example. Facts do not equal reality. Um, when you get a leader called of God, uh, the facts seem to be, well, other people are just as qualified. Uh, why shouldn't other people? And, you know, Korah and Dathan, they said, well, you know, who's this Moses? Now, the reality is, God calls a preacher. The reality is, when God calls a man, he's called to preach. He's sent, he's equipped. Uh, that's fact. But it's reality too. And the reality is, if a man is equipped and sent of God, then he has the gifts of God and he has the authority of God, and he has the backing of God, and he has the miracles of God, and he produces the work of God, and Korah and Datham weren't called of God, they weren't sent of God, they weren't equipped of God, and the big hole opened up, and they and their families descended into the pit. The priesthood was challenged. Do you remember Aaron's rod that budded? Oh, you know, why should Aaron be the high priest? Well, Aaron was the high priest because God chose him. This is old covenant. And you remember the 12 spies that went in. There was only two that were, remained faithful to God, and that was uh, Joshua and Caleb. Ten of them came back. Oh, there are giants in the land. Yeah, there'll be food for us, says Caleb. You know, it, it depends how you look on things. When you talk to, to congregate, I find some people are so negative. They'll always find what's wrong. There can be a thousand things that are right, they'll pick out the one thing that's wrong. That's the way some people are. Negativity is a destructive force. And you know, the devil sows negativity into your mind. Because he knows if he can get you thinking the wrong way, you end up outside of faith. You end up blaming God. You know, God is a good God. And my God is a gracious God. I find some people are trapped into negativity all the time. The natural mind is at enmity with God. People pick a fight because they can't help themselves because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. But you know, the carnal mind always has an excuse and is self-righteous and can always justify itself. That's how you find um, the priests who wanted to take over Aaron's job Cor and Dathan, that they were all, what they didn't like was authority. It, it's so annoying that God chooses whom he will. God takes the things that are not as though they were. And people resent it. <laughs> they, they, you know, they, they really, envy and jealousy is the trademark of the Christian ministry. Oh, you know, 
Why does he have all the opportunities? Why does he do this? But, terrible, isn't it? You see, when God chooses a man, they don't like it. They don't, they don't like the idea. Uh, and envy and jealousy, they want to pull him down. It's the way the human heart works. Instead of respecting and thanking God for what they've got, they want to kill him. Stupidity. But that, unfortunately, is the human heart. It's called the carnal mind and the work of the flesh. What roots? You know, when I go and talk to people, I ask them what roots. Is it the chicken or the egg? Do you, you know when you go back, people always are, are trying to work out how. People ask me, how, how come miracles happen in your ministry? How did you get the gifts? How do you do? Listen, I never asked God for any gift. I never prayed for a gift. I never sought for a gift. I've never sought for ministry. In fact, for years I've told people I'm not suitable to be a pastor. I haven't got the personality. I'm not the right type. And I'm not diplomatic enough. I know you'll find this hard to believe. I mean, you know. <laughs> I'm not diplomatic enough. I mean, I just say it the way... And, you know, I'm just kind of straight down the line. And If you don't like what I preach, go jump in the lake. Uh, you know, cool off. Uh, you, you don't... I just don't... I'm not the nice person you're meant to be. And, and I can't... That's me. I'm going to be me for the rest of my life. Uh, and okay, I've been born again. I've been filled with the Holy Ghost. But God didn't make me some kind of automated kind of Dalek. I will obey. I will obey. I mean, I'm not, you know, we have this treasure in an earthen vessel that the excellency of the power might be of God and not of us. And what has happened is people want to be clones don't you ever try and imitate me. One of me in the world is sufficient. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm my good friend T.L. Osborne. L listen, we go and we sit and we talk, T.L. and I. And, and he said to me recently, the only person in the world now he can sit down and talk openly about everything is with Ruth and I. So there's no one else. Oral said a similar thing. With Benson Ederholzer, we'd sit up and we'd talk about everything. But I tell you what, there was no edge or motive in it. We just discussed the way things are. You know, there is a good thing about being called and sent of God. I'm comfortable with the ministry I have. I'm comfortable to go and do what I do. Why? Because God sent me. I'm comfortable with it. Who's going to inherit my ministry? I couldn't care less. That's not my business. When I'm gone, put me in a cardboard box. I'm off. Uh, you know, I, they, they, there's all kinds of people are carnal. Look, God's in control. Don't you think he's got the world in his hands? Don't you think he, he knows? And it won't be what people think. It'll always be different. Elijah, he had 50 prophets. Every single one of them thought they were the one. They were in the school of the prophets. They were going to take over from Elijah. Uh, and there he was one day walking and there was this guy plowing a field called Elisha. And he was plowing his field and as Elijah went by, God said to him, throw your mantle over Elisha. And he threw his mantle over him. 
And I like it. You know, Elisha, he went and he slaughtered the bullocks and made a sacrifice. They were his father's bullocks, not his. <laughs> but <laughs> father came to the field and found all his bullocks burned up. And he went and he followed Elijah. And the school of the prophets, they all stayed the wrong side of Jordan when Elijah was taken up into heaven. God chooses whom he will. Why did he choose Elisha? Why not someone who'd trained? Because he chose whom he would. God's God. A, a, a natural man says things different. Natural man wants it to be different. The natural man doesn't understand the things of God. People don't understand what God's really about. Don't understand his nature. Don't understand his love. They don't know him. And Paul wrote to the Philippians that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. And, and, and you know, it's knowledge of him, the person, not knowledge of doctrine. It's the reality of the person. Do you know, there's times when you're so aware of God and you're so aware of his compassion. Uh, Christ lives in you. Uh, and you function out of the reality of his life. Wherever I go in the world, I always tell them, I haven't got a gift of healing, and I'm not a miracle worker. I've never worked a miracle. I've never healed anyone. I really can't. But I know someone who can. His name is Jesus, and he lives in me. And I'm alive in him. And I know he'll never fail. And do you know, I've seen the most remarkable things. Most remarkable miracles happen so easy. I suppose you get to the stage where you think, well, what was the most remarkable thing I saw? I think it was probably in Bulgaria. A woman walked in who was 60-odd, 60 62, 63, born with no eyes. No eyes at all, just empty sockets. Old woman. And when I prayed for the sick, there was a man who, who had gangrene in his arm. He was in his 60s. A dirty bandage over his arm, couldn't afford medicine, and gangrene had set in. It smelled putrid. You know, gangrene, you can smell it. And came out, and he held his arm out, touched him, prayed for him, and God healed him. The gangrene went, and he was completely healed. He had broken his arm, and... No way to said it. And God healed him completely. The next service we went to in the next city, he turned up there, he was waving his arm around, shouting, he was going to give his testimony. Dear old fella. He'd traveled about 200 miles just to get there, to give his testimony, how he'd had a broken arm and he was dying and he got gangrene and got healed. But the most remarkable thing was uh, I took the choir with us. And I remember hearing this piercing scream of this woman. And I, I asked the pastor, what's going on? And, and this woman with no eyes, God created eyes and gave her a sight. And suddenly she could see. And she screamed and screamed with a shock of it. Oh, man. 
I mean, that, what you call creative miracle, just beautiful. And, you know, those things, they just happen. And you see them and you saw a woman in Cameroon just when we went, I don't remember when we went, January. And um, she'd had an accident, a scar down her face, the eye had completely gone. She'd had in the accident, I can't remember, I think it was a car accident, wasn't it? And all I said was, if you're blind, put your hand over your eyes. And she put her hand to a dead socket. When she took her hand away, got to put an eyeball back there. Same as the other one, gave her a sight back. I mean, those things, no man can do them. Can't, you can't produce miracles. <laughs> or, let me give you another example. I, I suppose I've said it before, but in Uganda, when I was preaching and shouting started on the one of the bleachers, you know, in the crowd, and I thought, what's going on? And, said to the people, person who was interpreting for me, what's going on here? And he said, oh, the man was carried in, he was deaf and dumb, and God's opened his ear and loosed his tongue. So I said, get him down the front. And when he came down the front, I looked, and there was this, this individual, and he was all twisted over, and his right arm was all withered, and up in the side, and paralyzed down one side, and he dragged the dead, leg along. I was about four inches shorter than a normal leg and he was all twisted over and they carried him up to the platform and he stood there shaking, kind of palsy, saying hallelujah, praise God. He could hear, he could speak. So I said to him, I said, well, God's loosed your tongue and he's opened your ears, but he wants to do more than that. And I just took the withered hand and shook it and it just came out like the other one. And then I put my hand on his head and prayed for him. And he fell over. And I said, pick him up. And as they picked him up, his back went crack, crack, crack. And he stood straight. And his leg grew out. And he began to march up and down. I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm healed. You can't do that. Only he can do that. He's the miracle worker. And he lives in me. And, and it was so beautiful to see. Do you know he's the most effective evangelist in Uganda, in Kampala now? The very places where they carried him to beg on the street corners, he now stands and tells people, there's a Jesus. He's alive. He lives. We've got a gospel. Good news. It's not some fake religion it's not some philosophy it's not something you can take hold of and command yourself you, if you're not called of God and sent of God and equipped of God don't go when you put the responsibility on yourself it's an onerous responsibility when you realize it's him it's easy so, so easy. And that's the trouble with the kind of redemption story that people don't tell people anymore. If you want a harvest of miracles, start talking about them. Sow the seed. Tell everyone Jesus is the healer. You'll get miracles. Can't fail. Because he is. Tell the truth about him. He's risen. But for goodness sake, don't think that you're something great. You know, stretch forth your hands. You know, you've all got healing in your hands. Oh, that, that's witchcraft. You haven't got, I haven't got healing in my hands. 
I don't feel some kind of tingling down my hand or a hot feeling running down my leg. I mean, you know, or a twinge up my spine. I don't feel anything. That's not Christianity. That's freak show. He's the miracle worker. He's the one who does it all. We want to give glory unto him. He washes us from our sin. He delivers us. He's the saviour. He's the redeemer. Redemption's preaching Christ. 